Amen. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, worship team. And you may be seated, everybody, as we look to the Word of God together this morning. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 11 is where we will begin reading today. I told you Wednesday night, those of you who were here, that I've changed directions. I had about three sermon series in the works, and uh, most of those outlines written on all of those series, and I made the decision this week to move in a different direction. For the next four Sundays, Lord willing, we'll be looking at one of the famous promises of the Old Testament. It's found in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, it's a promise about healing. How many of you have ever needed healing in any area of your life? Sure we have. Not just in our physical bodies, but we need healing oftentimes in many categories, in many ways in our lives. And this promise is a promise about healing. It's also a promise to those who maybe have strayed away from the Lord or backed away from the Lord or distanced themselves. Did you know that sometimes even the most faithful followers can come to a place where they have distanced themselves from the Lord? The apostle Peter, when Jesus was arrested, the Bible says Peter, who had been with Jesus from the beginning, the Bible says Peter became afraid and he followed Jesus at a distance. Sometimes in life, God's people don't stay as close to the Lord as they should stay. This is a a message, this is a promise in the word of God about returning to a close relationship with the Lord. And it's about entering once again into the blessing of the Lord. The story comes to us from the days of King Solomon in the Old Testament, the son of King David. King Solomon was the builder of the first great temple in the city of Jerusalem. It was a massive temple for its day and it was an impressive structure that glittered like gold, shone like the sun. And it was a powerful testament to the presence of God in the midst of his people. That temple (laughs) built by King Solomon, uh, stretch your hands toward me right now. Stretch your hands, say, Lord, and give him more voice in Jesus' name. You say, well, I don't, I'd kind of be glad if you didn't have as much voice. This, no, don't go there. <laughs> Let's read the scripture before we say anything else. Second Chronicles seven eleven. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, The Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. This is one of the most quoted promises of the Old Testament. And it comes to us from God's message to King Solomon at the conclusion of the building of the temple in Jerusalem. It's around 950 BC, almost a thousand years before Jesus. The temple had taken some seven years to build. Solomon, at the conclusion of the building, leads a great dedication ceremony. And at that dedication ceremony of the temple, the presence of God is there powerfully. A cloud comes down and fills the temple of God. And the dedication festivities last for two weeks, two weeks of celebration at the conclusion of the building of the temple. At the end of the temple celebration, Solomon is 
at home in his palace. And in the middle of the night, the Lord appears to him with a word for the days and years to come. Everybody's excited right now, says the Lord. This beautiful temple has just been completed. And the the dedication celebration was magnificent. But in the years to come and in the days to come, says the Lord, my people might abandon their devotion to me. They might turn away from me and they might walk out from under my blessings. And, And if that happens, says the Lord, then I want my people to think about me, to remember me and to return to me, says the Lord. How many of you know the Lord wants everybody to be saved who will be saved? And how many of you know that when someone wanders away from a relationship with the Lord, how many of you know the Lord wants them back? That's the story of the prodigal son in the New Testament. When somebody wanders away from relationship with the Lord, the Lord's Holy Spirit is reaching, moving, stirring to bring them back into relationship with him. And this is a promise in the pages of the Old Testament where God says, if my people wander away from me in their devotion, I want them to return to me. Not only do I want to restore their relationship with me, but I want to bless them all over again. Sometimes in our humanness we think, I have forfeited the blessings of God for the rest of my life. Sometimes people think because of what I have done and where I have been, I have forfeited the blessings of God for the rest of my life. I want you to know that is a lie from the devil. And God is a God who wants to restore the backslider and bring that backslider back into a place of fellowship and forgiveness and freedom and in a place where the blessings of the Lord are flowing fully in their lives again. Oh, aren't you glad that we humans don't have to be the judge? I want you to know God is far more merciful than any of us humans, we want to hold on to things maybe, but God says, if you'll return to me, I will open up the floodgates of heaven again and you will live under the flow of my blessings once again. And God gives Solomon in this appearance at night a recipe for restoration for those who have strayed away from him. For the people of God in the Old Testament, This was a promise for the healing of land, for the physical land. I thought down through the years that I believe that that many Christians over the years have sort of misinterpreted and misapplied this promise of Scripture. We we think about, well, if, if Christians start praying again, then God will heal America. Well, how many of you know for the blessing of the Lord to be upon America, America needs to turn to God? But how many of you know God's people need his blessings in all of their endeavors? Say amen. And so this is a recipe for healing, not particularly healing for physical land, but a recipe for healing in relationship with the Lord. A recipe for bringing us back into the fullness of his favor and his fellowship. The best place in the world to live. I've entitled this series of lessons, If My People Will. Next Sunday morning, we'll talk more about the issue of willingness. But how many of you know, if we're going to do anything in life, we've got to be willing If we're gonna live for God, we've got to be willing. We'll talk about a willing spirit next Sunday morning if we're still here. But this morning, I wanna come to the first key that God provides to Solomon for moving back into the fullness of relationship with God. And it's the key of remembering who we are and who we belong to. Listen, I pray that every person who has strayed away from God. And you know in this service this morning, you know people 
who have lived for God once, but now they are away from God. They are out of fellowship with God. They are out of relationship with God. And because of that, they are most likely not living under the flow of God's blessings as they should. We know what it is to have people who are close to us who wander and stray away from the Lord. Our prayer this morning in this particular message is that they will remember who bought them a long time ago, who put his name upon them, who they belong to, and that they will say within their hearts, I've got to get back home. Amen. I've got to get back home. And so this morning's lesson comes from these two, uh, from, from, from these words in the promise today. If my people who are called by my name, and we'll stop right there for this morning. My people, says God, who are called by my name. So we're going to think this morning about this scripture with two declarations. One, as God's people, we are claimed, God calls us his people, we are claimed, and we are named. We are called by the name of the Lord. Let's begin by thinking about the claim of the Lord that rests upon us as God's people. God clearly directs this promise to people who have known him and who have walked in relationship with him. In the Old Testament, he's talking to the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, the nation he has delivered out of bondage. We'll get to that in a minute. But he's applying this promise to those who have known the Lord and walked in relationship with him. And he says, these are my people. Do you know, friends, we belong to the Lord. We belong to him. And I wanna think about how we belong to the Lord from the scriptures this morning. And I wanna say, first of all, that we are God's people by rights of creation. Lest anybody get arrogant or prideful and think that somehow they don't belong to God, I want us to remember that it's God who created every human being that lives. We belong to God, we are his people by rights of creation. God created us. He created us to flourish. We read it in Genesis chapter one. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move around along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. God is the creator of the human race. Now we could go a lot of different directions with that this morning and declare that the God who created us not only owns us, but has the right to declare the yes and the no to the human race, would you say amen? Amen. He is God. If God says this is right, it's right. If God said that's wrong, it's wrong. God as creator of the universe holds the authority over us to govern us. He owns us, we are his by rights of creation. He created us to flourish and secondly we note in the New Testament that God created us for fellowship. Paul preaches in Acts chapter 17 these words. He's preaching in a heathen city, the city of Athens, and he preaches these words to the people there. The God who made the world and everything in it is Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. How many of you know that your very breath has been given to you by God? Say amen. From one man, God made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. 
God did this so that men do you see that? God did this so that men would what? Would seek him and perhaps what? Reach out for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So we see in the New Testament that God not only created mankind to flourish in the earth, but he created the human race for fellowship with himself so that every human being would reach out to him and say, oh, God, where are you? And we would reach out to him. And when we reach out to him, we would find, and we would find it through the gospel, that he's not very far from any one of us. And we grab hold of God, and we we begin a relationship with the God of heaven and earth. God created us for fellowship. And I want you to know that is still the heart of God today. You remember the greatest commandment in the pages of scripture? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. More than anything else, God wants a relationship with you and with me. We are God's people by rights of creation. He created us to flourish. He created us for fellowship. But we are owned by the Lord. We belong to the Lord in a second fashion as well. We are God's people. Now think about these words with me. By redemptive covenant and responsive commitment. In other words, look at me everybody. In other words, God says, I wanna make an agreement with you. And he holds out the agreement. And we see the agreement and we say, Yes, I believe I'll take that agreement. Are you here? That's as simple for us as New Testament believers as understanding that our salvation is by grace through faith. All right? God's grace reaches to us. God says, here's what I've done so that you can be saved. And we say in faith, I believe that. And I'll accept that. And we come into relationship with God through a holy covenant and through our commitment to that covenant. And the Lord says, I'll take you as my own. And we say, yes, sir, you can have me. Everybody say, Lord, Lord. you can have me. Most of you here in the room, the Lord already has you. You're living in fellowship with him through a covenant. Notice now, we think about that in the Old Testament and the New Testament. This redemptive covenant and this responsive commitment. God rescued the Jews. He covenanted and contracted with them and they agreed and accepted a new identity and a new inheritance. Listen to it in Exodus chapter 19, verse three. Then Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, this is what you are to say to the house of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. God says, I rescued you from slavery in Egypt, God says. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my what? My treasured possession. I want you for myself, says God. You'll be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. Look up at me, everybody. Moses came down and said, here's the deal the Lord God Almighty is offering you. Here it is. Here it is. And notice the response of the people. Moses went back. 
He summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. And the people all responded together. Listen to this. We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. Do you get that this morning? God said, I've rescued you. Now I want to make a covenant with you of relationship forever. And he offered this to the people. They heard it and they said, we'll take it. We'll take it. How many of you are bargain shoppers? How many of you like to dicker over the price? Yeah. Sometimes the price that's offered you up front is so good that there's no need to dicker over the price. Are you here? You look at it and you say, I can't even believe that price is being offered to me. I'll take, how many of you know what it is to say, I'll take it before somebody else gets in the mix. <laughs> Yesterday I was looking, here's, the, here's my freshest illustration of the day. Yesterday, you know, it's very difficult to find an, an NIV translation of the Bible in the 1984 version which is the version I preach from. I have several of those Bibles, but you cannot buy them from the publisher any longer. You can't even get it on computer. We are grandfathered in in our office to have these words that I print for you every week. I had been looking at this Bible on eBay, a giant print, and how many of you know that has its own advantages these days? A giant print, 1984, New International Version of the Bible. It was in beautiful condition, and I got an email. I had put it on my watch list, and I got an email yesterday that said, this, this has dropped in price. Here it is. Do you want it? I saw it on my, I logged in. I thought for a moment. I thought, you know, I, I ought to get that because I'll never find another one of those. I ought to get that. I looked back at the email. I clicked back on the item. And guess what? This item is no longer available. <laughs> Anybody ever been there and done that? Yeah. Sometimes the price is so good that you just better not wait any longer. Could you say amen? Amen. And God said to the Old Testament Israelites, here's the deal I want to make with you. If you'll walk in my ways and keep my commandments, you're going to be my treasured possession. I'm going to choose you as my people. And it was such an awesome offer that the people of God said, we'll take it. Now, how many of you know we're, we're coming to the New Testament now? And in the New Testament, we see that God redeemed us through Jesus, called us and courted us through the work of the Holy Spirit. He drew us to himself. How many of you know the Holy Spirit reveals the love of God to us? Say amen. How many of you at one time or another in your life as a Christian, you have sensed the Holy Spirit reminding you that God loves you? Say amen. Oh, yes. And even in those early days when we first heard the gospel, we felt and sensed the tugging of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was saying, oh, I love you. I love, oh, God loves you. So God redeemed us through the work of Jesus. He called us and courted us to himself and we agreed and accepted a new identity and a new inheritance. For the people of God in the Old Testament, that new identity was the identity as the people of God. Who wouldn't want that? The people of God. But it also included a new inheritance. They inherited the land and all of the blessings that God had to pour out upon them. Now we, as children of the living God, through the work of Jesus Christ, we have agreed to the terms of the contract. How many of you are glad that Jesus died for your sins? Say amen. <coughs> How many of you believe today that Jesus rose from the dead and he's alive today? 
How many at one time or another felt the Lord calling you to himself and courting you and convincing you of his love and, and you, you, you felt drawn to the Lord? How many of you this morning? And how many of you, it was so good. The deal was so good that you just said, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. The, the salvation that God has for us is so good. I just don't know how anybody could turn it down. Are you here? I don't know how anybody could turn it down. God's love and his grace and we agreed and accepted a new identity and a new inheritance. Our identity, we are the people of God. Our inheritance, the promises of God that reach all the way to heaven and eternal life. How many of you know we are rich beyond compare? And we read that in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. You have not come to a, remember, we read about the old mount, mountain, Mount Sinai where Moses went up and got the covenant from God. Now in Hebrews chapter 12, we read about another mountain. I love this. You haven't come to Mount Sinai, a mountain that can be touched and is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further words be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. Even if an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I'm trembling with fear. That's that first mountain we read about a while ago. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands and thousands of angels in joyful assembly. You have come to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. Doesn't that sound like a good move upward. Yeah, that sounds like moving on up, doesn't it? You have come to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The the writer of Hebrews says this, the Old Testament people had an awesome covenant with God, but they, listen, they didn't know, they didn't experience anything compared to the covenant that we have with Almighty God through the wonderful work of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We have come to the hope of everlasting life through Jesus, our Savior. Oh, I I wish I had a stronger voice today. I'd be shouting down the house. Such a a good word. So we we have a new identity and a new inheritance through Jesus. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Get this, a people belonging to God so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We belong to God. How many of you today have accepted Jesus Christ and his salvation into your life? Say amen. Listen, you belong to Jesus. That song Heidi taught us last year or so has been ringing through my mind this week. I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. I don't have to fear. I belong to Jesus. We belong to Jesus by this covenant. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says this. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Look up at me, everybody. Look up at me. In our relationship with the Lord, our heart belongs to Jesus. Could I have a better amen? Our heart belongs to Jesus. Our mind belongs to Jesus. Could you say amen? Our spirit man belongs to Jesus. Could you say amen? And now we find even our bodies belong to Jesus. Your body, Christian believer, belongs to Jesus. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians, you, your body was bought with a price. 
And what was that price? It's the price of the death of Jesus Christ. He, in other words, when the Lord Jesus bought you in that covenant, he bought every fiber of your being. He bought you body, mind, soul, and spirit. Every piece and part of you belongs to Jesus. And how many of you know the Lord Jesus wants, to, wants you to live for him with every piece and part of your being? Say amen. You belong to Jesus. And then, of course, one other ver- there are many verses about relationship with God, but John 3, 29 says, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. We have married the Lord Jesus and we belong to him. We belong to the Lord. We're his covenant people. We're his purchased people, his collected family, his bride, his children. We are chosen and cherished and God's, listen, listen, listen. God's claims upon us are joyful claims. I want you to know if you belong to the Lord, He's glad to have you. Huh? His claims upon us are joyful claims. And they are jealous claims. If you belong to the Lord, he doesn't want anybody else having you. Hmm? No no other devotions that, that match up and contradict with and conflict with your devotion to God. How many of you know you can't serve two masters? If Jesus is your Lord, don't let let the devil lord it over you. Are you here? His claims upon us are joyful claims. They are jealous claims. And they are just claims. We belong to him. And we belong to him because he paid such a high price. And we have come into agreement with him. Look up at me, everybody. I want to say to you this morning, if you belong to Jesus, there's nothing and nobody and nowhere that you could go that's better than living close to Jesus. Are you here? You say, I believe I'll go out there and have fun in that category. For There's nothing in this world that can match up to a relationship with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are God's people. By rights of creation, by redemptive covenant and responsive commitment. And thirdly, we are God's people by a resounding claim. He makes it known to everybody, these people are mine. Listen to Isaiah 51. Is everybody still awake with me today? Say amen. Amen. Listen to Isaiah 51 verse 15. For I am the Lord your God who churns up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord Almighty is his name. I have put my words in your mouth and covered you with the shadow of my hand. I who set the heavens in place, who laid the foundations of the earth and who says to Zion, you are my people. That's what God says. He says, I am the Lord God Almighty and I have chosen you to be my people. Aren't we privileged this morning? Look at it in Romans chapter 9, verse 25. As God says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people. And I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And it will happen that in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people they will be called sons of the living God. What is that prophecy from Hosea all about? That prophecy is a prophecy about the bringing in of the, of the non-Jewish world from all over creation. They were on the outside looking into God's covenant, but God says, no, no, I, lo- I love the whole wide world. I love everybody in this world. And even though it used to be said about them, they're on the outside and they belong to somebody else. God says, no, by my love and by my grace, I'm gonna reach out to this whole wide world and where people were called not my people, they're going to be called children of the living God. Aren't you glad for the grace of God? Jesus said it this way in his ministry. Jesus said, even as he was speaking to God's people, the Jewish people, he said, I have other sheep who belong to a different fold 
I've got to go and get them too. Listen, you and I were part of that other bunch. But aren't you glad the Lord came after us? So we, we belong to the Lord. He's called us his people. Hebrews 2.11, I love this. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, here am I and the children God has given me. Listen, Jesus is not ashamed to call us his family. (laughs) Have you ever known somebody who was ashamed of a family member? Don't tell us this morning. (laughs) But the scripture says Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brothers and his children. He announces that everybody, this one belongs to me. This one belongs to me. Hebrews eleven fifteen. If they, the, the God's people, had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. God says, I'm not ashamed of you because you're, you're wanting to follow me all the way home. And so I'll I'll bring, thank God we're not looking to go backward. Could you say amen? Amen. Hebrews says, they could have said, well, we want to go back to where we came from. But thank God they said, no, we're moving forward to what God has for us in the future. Look look up at at me, everybody. There is nothing in this world to go back to. Nothing. Every blessing, every blessing that your heart could ever desire is waiting up ahead for you in the presence and promise of God. Yeah. So we are claimed. God says, you are my people. And we say, amen. How many of you would say amen to that? We are claimed. And as we are claimed, we are also named. This promise says, if my people who are called by my name. When the Lord, here's the simple truth of that. When the Lord claims us for his own, he, he puts a, a label on us that says, oh, this one, is, this one belongs to the Lord. He labels us. He stamps his name upon us. And so as people who are claimed by God, we are also bearing the name of God. We are God's people. Those who are called by my name. You know, it's a privilege to be called by such a mighty name as the name of the Lord our God. That name first revealed to Moses at the burning bush. I am. I am the Lord. And all of the all of the ramifications of that name. I am the Lord, your healer. I am the Lord, your righteousness. I am the Lord, your banner. I am the Lord, your shepherd. I am the Lord, the Lord's name placed upon our lives. Listen to what Deuteronomy chapter 28 says. His name, the Lord's name indicates attachment and allegiance. Verse nine, Deuteronomy 28, the Lord will establish you as his holy people, as he promised you on oath. If you keep the commands of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, then all the peoples on earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they will fear you. They'll see that you're called by the name. Oh, those are God's people. Those are God's people. Now, we live in a world today where sometimes God's people are not respected very well and not treated very well because the spirit of Antichrist is at work in the world today and the world sometimes works against God's people. But I want you to know, whatever comes, are you listening this morning? Whatever comes in this world, I want you to know, you better stick with the Lord. 
It's better to bear the name of the Lord and be persecuted for the name of the Lord than to walk out from under the covering of God's name. Yeah. How many of you, you're gonna claim God's name upon you no matter what? Say amen. We read it in the New Testament, Acts eleven twenty six. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. God's name is a label of ownership. It's a name marking out his presence with us and his commitments to us, his attachment and allegiance to us and ours to him. Listen, when I, sometimes I ask people in Jefferson City, I say, are you a Christian? I have found that many people in our own city here do not even know how to answer that question. I will ask people, are you a Christian? And they will say, well, I'm such and such. And they will name the name of some church. I don't know about you, but if somebody asks me, are you a Christian? I'm not going to say, well, I'm assembly of, I'm assemblies of God. Now, how many of you know, I'm grateful to be a part of the fellowship called the assemblies of God, but my allegiance and the name upon my life is not the name assemblies of God. It's the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I ask people in this city, are you a Christian? And they will say, well, I'm such and such. Sometimes people don't even know what it means to have the name of Jesus attached to them. Listen, friends, when when that name is attached to us, I hope you're with me this morning when I say, when we call ourselves Christians, we ought not be doing so just because we go to church or just because, you know, we have some kind of a religious background or just because grandma was a Christian or just because, God forbid, forbid, just because we live in America. When we say I'm a Christian, that means the Lord Jesus Christ is my Savior and my Lord. I am, I am pleased and proud to bear the name of my Savior and my Lord and my leader who has walked with me all of these days and who's going to lead me to heaven someday. I am glad to bear the name of Jesus. Jesus himself said when he was doing his ministry. He said, don't ever be ashamed of me. Don't ever be ashamed of me in this wicked world. I want you to know there's a lot in this world to be ashamed of, but a relationship with Jesus is not one of them. Yeah, a relationship with Jesus is one of the most precious and sacred things. And to bear his name is a privilege. Think about that. Having the name that is above every name attached to your life and your identity. Huh, that's good. Ooh, this is better preaching than your amen in this morning. Whew. His name marks us out both as individuals and as a collective people for who we are, sorts us and separates us out and reminds us of who we are. His name indicates attachment and allegiance. And secondly, as we draw to a close this morning, his name indicates authority and assignment. Think about this. When the name of the Lord rests upon us, we move about and do our business in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to it in the scriptures. First Samuel 17, David said to the Philistine, the giant Goliath, we studied this a few months ago. David said to the giant, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. I want you to know when we are genuinely God's people and we are moving about in God's name, there is authority that comes with that. Listen to it in Mark chapter 16. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. 
They will pick up snakes with their hands and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. What Jesus is saying there is this. When you move out under the name of Jesus and in the authority of the name of Jesus and in the assignments of Jesus upon your life, when you move out in the name of Jesus, the power of God will accompany your ministry and your work because you're bearing that name of Jesus and the name of Jesus has authority and power. I don't know about you. I I know that I'm a preacher. I say the words in the name of Jesus countless times every day. I do, that's that's part of my, my ingrown vocabulary in the name of Jesus. I, I say that countless times. I, I, as I pray throughout the day, as I draw, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, in the name, try that out, in the name of Jesus. Speak it out, in the name of Jesus. We bear the name of Jesus, and Jesus says, when we march forth in his name, that signifies his authority and his assignment upon our lives. We read it in Colossians chapter three, verse 17, this word. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. There's so much to that charge. There's, there, there's a two-sided, there's a two-sided thought process to that charge. Whatever you do, do it in the name of Jesus. Think about this with me. Whatever you do in ministry, if you go out to give somebody a sandwich, do it in the name of Jesus, right? If you're putting your tithes into the offering basket, do it in the name of Jesus, right? You know, if you're, if you're going out and whatever, any kind of ministry work you're doing, do it in the name of Jesus. Listen, we might as listen, we might as well not hide ourselves under a bushel. We might as well let everybody know that anything good that we can ever accomplish is done because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Are you here this morning? Whatever you do, do it in the name of Jesus. But I also believe this charge means this. Whatever you do in life, you ought to be able to do that in the name of Jesus. Don't do anything that you couldn't do with the name of Jesus stamped upon that. Are you here? Don't do any, no, if you're gonna go out and be mean to somebody, if you can't stamp the name of Jesus on that, just let that go. Are you here? I don't know about you, but I don't wanna live half of my life in the name of Jesus and half of my life outside the name of Jesus. Are you here? Are you here? Whatever you do, Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Will you wear the Lord's name upon your life? How many here in the house today, you belong to the Lord and you're glad about it. Say a good amen. Say, I belong to the Lord. How many of you would say, Jesus is my Lord? He is my Lord. He's not just my Savior. He's my Lord. I belong to him. Will you wear his name upon your life? Will you walk and live and move in the name of Jesus? Will you boldly share and declare the name of Jesus around about you? Well, if you will, wear the Lord's name, then wear it courageously and confidently. Don't ever back up and be ashamed of the name of Jesus. We, listen, if God is willing to say about me, that's my people, then I am happy to respond by saying, yes, I am. 
I'm a child of God. I belong to him. Jesus is my Lord, hallelujah. Wear that name of the Lord courageously and confidently. Wear it consistently. Are you here? Wear the name of the Lord consistently. Now, don't wear the name of the Lord on Sunday mornings and drop off his name from your life on Monday, Tuesday. Oh, maybe come back on Wednesday night and put the name tag. Listen, when we wear the Lord's name, it's not a name tag that we take off and put on. Amen. It's a name inscribed upon our lives. Wear his name consistently and wear the Lord's name conscientiously and carefully. <laughs> don't fall into the mistake of saying, well, I don't want to tell people that, that I'm a Christian because sometimes I don't act like it. And I, you know, I don't want to bring any disgrace to the Lord. Listen, that's not the right process of thinking. The right process of thinking is, I want to let everybody know that I'm a Jesus follower. And then I'm going to cause my actions, my lifestyle to follow suit. And I'm going to wear the name of the Lord conscientiously and carefully so that I'm a good representation of the Lord. The promise that's before us in the pages of scripture today is this promise. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. And seek my, these are promises to God's people, to people who have known the Lord and been claimed by the Lord. What a privilege that is. Let's live up to the full measure of what it means to be in a relationship with God. Proverbs 22 says, a good name is better than great riches. I want you to know this morning, we have a good name resting upon our lives. The name of the Lord Jesus, amen.